Welcome back to the Policy Viz Podcast. I'm your host, John Schwabish. On this week's episode of the show, we turn our attention to AI, which, if you've been paying attention to anything around the world, you know is a big conversation. We're not going to focus on ChatGPT or Dolly. We are going to talk to Accio co-founder John Riley about the work his firm is doing in this space of AI when it comes to generative models and data visualization and trying to bring AI to folks to visualize and analyze their data quickly and more easily. Uh, we'll see what the future holds, of course, for AI. And it's an interesting conversation to see how some of the early companies in this space are trying to utilize AI to help folks work with their data better and more efficiently and ultimately create better visualizations. So here's my conversation with John Riley. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the podcast. Hey, John, good afternoon. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, really excited. Obviously, AI stuff has exploded in the last few months uh, with uh, Dolly, with images, and ChatGPT with text, and some of the other new video things coming out. I don't really know anything about it, to be frank. Um, but you and your company, Accio, are kind of in a unique niche about data and AI. So I'm curious to learn more about it and what you've seen happening, particularly the last few months. Um, but maybe we'll just start like your background. I think if I read your bio, right, like you, you, you're an electrical engineer by training. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and way and back. A path now to AI. Yeah. So yeah. I'm curious, like, how, what's that path? Um, so, so the path uh, kind of goes squarely through product management, really. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I think. Um, you know, I, start, I started designing televisions for Sony Electronics back in the day, uh, you know, video processing circuitry, primarily analog stuff. Um, and uh, and I got into engineering because I liked uh, sort of the discreteness of solutions, if you know what I mean. Like mm -hmm. uh, if, if you were right about something, you could sort of prove it to everybody and uh, point to the fact that it worked the way you expected. And, and that was that was like a really satisfying. Um, but. Uh, yeah. But pretty early in my career, I was like kind of wondering how the decisions about what to build were getting made and why they were getting made. And, um, and so I got into product management uh, and uh, and then through product management, found my way into a, a series of like smaller companies um, that grew and were successful. But I realized I really like the sort of startup uh, side of things. Um, but but the transition mm -hmm. to AI really happened when I took over marketing at the last startup I was working at, uh, this 3D printing company. And um, in that capacity, uh, I realized there was a whole bunch of data-driven workflows inside of the business where we had a lot of information but needed to make real-time decisions about what to do so that we could behave optimally. I mean, you know, lead scoring is the classic case here. Uh, there's a lot of studies that show that if you can respond to an inbound lead in the first you know, 10 or 30 minutes of them like getting in contact or requesting a demo or a chat, um, your connection mm -hmm. uh, probabilities are way higher. Your sales probabilities are way higher. You, like people appreciate responsiveness. Um, right. We had way too many coming in. We couldn't sort them. We couldn't tell which ones were the good ones. And so right. uh, we, um, we started looking for solutions that would allow us to sort of tell if a lead was more likely to close than a different lead. Um, and there's a lot of traditional ways of doing that, like looking at their behavior or their firmographic information. Um, but really, machine learning models are like perfect for that, right? They, they pattern match very well. Um, and so we, we set around to start, you know, employing some machine learning models. We went with some contractors. Um, these are largely professional services solutions. You know, they, they kind of have a data scientist like on their side that does it for you. Um, yeah big communication like loop problems. And, and we just kind of realized while we were going through this that, you know, it would be really nice if there was a tool that let someone who is data competent, who is a subject matter expert in what you were working on, actually build some of these models themselves and, and deploy them and put them to use. And so that was sort of the founding principle behind Accio. And yeah, it's kind of a winding path, electrical engineering to product management yeah. and at Sonos and an audio company, wireless audio to 3D printing yeah. to AI. Um, but, but it's always kind of been chasing like, something interesting uh, that has like uh, like real application that, that I feel like uh, so some sense of like need or urgency around uh, having. And, and so that's sort of been the connecting tissue is like, um, yeah. you know, trying to sort of build something that I think will be really relevant to a lot of people going forward. Right. So tell me a little bit about what Accio does. I know it's, it's focused on the AI and the data intersection there. And I'm, I'm curious how uh, folks 
folks like me, regular folks, yeah. I'll call them regular folks. Although people listening to this podcast, you are, we're not really regular, right? Exact, not really regular folks, but regular, how regular folks can, can use it. So yeah. let's start with what it does first or what you guys do first. And then yeah. We'll so, so basically um, it lets anyone with historic data um, build predictive models uh, and understand the patterns in their data that are driving their outcomes of interest, whatever those are. Those are usually key business like outcomes that you're interested in, things like uh, revenue or uh, churn or you know conversion of like uh, customers. Um, you basically uh, can feed it historic information. It'll automatically, it's, it's through a process called AutoML and, and specifically a search for the right neural architecture, so neural architecture search. Um, it'll find the uh, patterns, surface those to you so you can see what's driving your outcome. And then you can actually deploy those models and use them in real time decision making. So you get sort of two benefits. Um, the first is by seeing the patterns, you can make some strategic decisions. So that might be mm -hmm. where to focus your efforts. If it's if it's lead scoring, you know, you'll sort of see these types of leads are better than these types. So let's focus our marketing on this type of lead. Um, but you can also then, you know, hook it up to any of your systems in real time and you know, get a get a um, get a prediction on every record that gets changed or updated or comes in, and uh, if you can act on those predictions, any any and and these these applications are all machine learning applications. Um, there's there's like a long history of value in businesses now, uh, but usually it's delivered by the data science team. So what Accio does uniquely right. is we make it really easy for anyone anyone who can work in Excel to start building these same types of models. Um, seeing what's driving those outcomes and take advantage of them in their business decision making. And that, that's mm -hmm. the long and short of it. Um, you know, we've recently also been uh, pretty popular because we built a, um, an NLP or, or a GPT-4 actually enabled feature at the front end um, that lets you transform your data so you can just make any request in natural language to do a data transformation like you know, reformat this date to an ISO standard or something, and it'll just do it. Yeah. Um, or, uh, you know, I think most interestingly for people, uh, data visualization. So you can ask it to build you a chart um, on, on your data after you connect it, and it will. Um, and then, you know, right. we build the data pipeline uh, between the data set and that chart. So it, it makes it so you don't need to know SQL or, or be able to code in order to accomplish all of these tasks. Um, you know, you just need to need to be able to like uh, sort of understand what's going on in the data, like, a, you know, mm -hmm. the subject matter expert and, you know, ask the right questions to get the insights you're after or, you know, point it at the outcome you're interested in and let it tell you. Right. So let's let's start at the beginning of that of that process, mm -hmm. because I load in my data. I mean, it, it's it has been said to me that regression analysis is machine learning, which is kind of like, yeah. OK, I guess. But eh, OK, but this but but. It, how conditional on the predictive modeling is the data that I load into, into the tool and where does the tool help me? Can the tool help me identify what I'm missing? Yeah. So the, the real interesting answer here is you never know um, if your data is going to support predicting your outcome until you train a model. Uh, and right. so from the beginning, we assumed a couple of things because this is our experience operating businesses we assumed your data was going to be messy, um, meaning we we assumed there were going to be lots of blank values um, that you were going to have, like some some like numbers and category columns, all sorts of messiness is going to be going on because yeah. that's very very typical. Um, and so we designed our uh, our ML engine to be robust to that when you're training models, um, and uh, and we made the process workflow very quick to getting to an answer of like here's how well your data predicts your outcome. So so the really only conditional piece of it is you need your data to be in tabular format. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we're not going to do any of the like PDF extraction and we, we don't process images. We're just, we're just tabular business data. Um, but right. if, but if you have it in a CSV form, you know, where you've got like, uh, you know, headers in row one for your columns and then, you know, record, 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 uh, we can take it and we can, uh, and we'll automatically build you a model that is correct to the type of outcome you're predicting. We do, we do three basic model types, uh, regression or numerical predictions, uh, classification, categorical modeling, and also time series, which, um, which is an area that's like, typically very difficult for people to work with is the concept of uh, building a time-driven model. Um, and we mm -hmm. do that too. Um, so, so, and, and we've put a lot of effort into trying to take your data in the format it is, which is to say, you know, however it comes out of your system or is in your data warehouse yeah. and, uh, and make it like pretty much straightforward into modeling without you having to worry about doing a bunch of 
reshaping of it. Um, but we do yeah. have tools like like this natural language, like a uh, transformation tool and a uh, auto clean tool that you can click and we'll just create some, you know, automatic cleaning things that are typically best practices before ML for you in a single click. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, there's a couple right. places where we make it pretty easy. I mean, ease of use is our whole value proposition. So we sure. work real hard on sure. that. Sure. Right. No, right. I mean, I'm always for like, you know, not everybody needs to be a coder. Right. And so, you know, make it easy for people. So I load my data in. I can I can also specify that the code 999 is a missing value. It's not a actual value. Yeah. Um, do I need to do that? Can the... Yeah, we're, like, so we're not going to know yeah. that bit. So if there's if there's right. a specific nuance in the data set, um, you know, if, if you're missing a value, we actually inc- encode that value as missing. And then we try and learn if there's a pattern when it's missing versus mm. when it's present. Um, yeah. You don't necessarily need to translate that 999 into anything. We'll just encode it and then... Um, we'll learn the pattern there and then we'll tell you like, hey, when right. we see 999, here's what we uh, noticed is the impact on your outcome. Um, right. And then uh, and then you can be like, oh, OK, well, I know what 999 means. So I know like uh, what this situation yeah. means for the outcome. And um, right. or, you know, if you're just feeding us a new record and it has that code, um, we'll take that that uh, field and, and all the other you know their features, they're called uh, of, of the record and um, we'll use them to uh, make a prediction. And when it and when it does that prediction. Again, thinking about the person who may not understand, let's say, even basic OLS regression, they load in their data. Does does Accio tell the user, you know, the R squared is such and such, and then kind of translate what that means for people? Yeah, we, we don't start at the depth. So <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the, the trick to ease of use, in my experience, is like... Um, is like progressive unfolding of complexity. So you want to start like really simple. Um, mm-hmm. And so like if we're doing a classification problem, uh, the first two pieces of information we tell you are how many times the model got it right as a as a percentage. And so so a standard training process, you withhold twenty percent of the data, you train on eighty percent, and then you like mm-hmm. you predict against the twenty you didn't show the training process, and you see how well you did at it. Um, and so we show you that performance, you know, the model is like 95% accurate. Uh, of course Mm -hmm. that value could be, um, could be misleading, right? Because if you have an imbalanced class, like, like, let's say like this lead scoring application we're talking about, you know, like, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, your leads, 10% of the deals that come in, uh, to the front door might actually convert into business. Um, and so, you know, if your model just guessed nobody would ever convert, it'd be right, you know, 90% of the time. And you think you had a really good model, but you have a terrible model, right? So, so the, yeah. So then, you know, we get to thinking about that. And and the real thing is like, okay, so if your outcome of interest is the rare case, which is almost always the reason to leverage machine learning, because you're looking for like uh, diamonds in the rough, so to speak. Um, right. Then, um, then, then what's important is like how often when the model thinks it's going to be a converted lead or, or the outcome of interest, uh, is it actually that uh, outcome? Um, you know, like uh, what, what is the densification rate? versus the base rate in the data set. So if when the model thinks a lead's going to convert, it does 50% of the time, but in the base mm-hmm. data rate, it only converts 10% of the time, you've sort of got a real business value to using that model now, right? You've densified the outcome of interest by about yeah. five times. And so the second piece of information we show you is how much denser the outcome of interest is, even at a 50% decision threshold. Um, and of mm-hmm. course, like further down, we'll show you some tools where you can like set different decision thresholds and understand different densifications because really you're making a probabilistic decision. And so yeah. your business needs to account for like, it's like dollar value capture. Right. Um, but, yeah. but so we start there and then, you know, you can drill down into the advanced settings and see the full confusion matrix, the F1 score. Um, but everywhere we show you one of those complicated data science terms, we define it for you right next to it. So you can see what's mm-hmm. going on and what it means and which direction is better or worse for that score. Um, and you can yeah. even drill all the way down and you know see the actual model we picked and the other models we compared it against and how they performed on a relative basis. Um, so, so depending on like your, your level of advancement, you might drill down into sort of these details. But for most users, you know, we stop there and then we move directly into, okay, let's take a look at what's driving your outcomes. What are the patterns in your data? that are relevant Mm -hmm. to predicting this outcome. And then we show you like, here's the fields that are most important. Here's the value in those fields that impact the outcome in which ways. Um, You know, here's on any given feature, here's a segment of that feature that's interesting for this reason and is associated with this outcome. Um, And so so we try and present, you know, like all of this is like, uh, like 
like really carefully crafted presentation of information. Like if, if you know, and, yeah. and I, I'm not sure, you know, that we're super mature on this yet. There's still miles to go. I think, I think we're probably still more confusing than we should be, to be honest. You know, uh, people, mm-hmm. people tell us that we're the easiest one they've used, but, um, you know, presenting visual information about data is, is hard to do in a simple manner. Right. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and so, yeah. um, so yeah, we always try and ask ourselves like, uh, for this thing that we're showing you, does it make sense in the order it's being shown? And do you get right. exactly what's happening at a glance? And, right. uh, and then once we feel like we're confident in that we go, you know, use a, use a platform that allows you to interview analysts or your target user. And we show it to them and say, what does this tell you? And if they oh, can't, if they yeah. can't answer that, then you go back to the drawing board and try again. Right. <laughs> try again. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was going to ask you about the feedback you've gotten on the, on this particular part. I, I want to get to the data viz part in a, in a second, but are you finding that most of your users are the non data scientist type folk? Yeah. It's, and are um, they, you know, yeah. that that's, that's our target. So, so the, our thesis is, it, and, and this is like uh, what, what we hear every day when we talk to customers, um, most businesses have a data science team of some kind, uh, mm-hmm. especially most mature businesses. And those, that data science team is super critical. They're working on like, the 10% problems, call them, you know, the, the most important business differentiated problems there yeah. are in the organization. They need like really complex, powerful tooling that gives them a fine degree of control over every little bit of the product. And so their needs are like wildly different than our target users needs. And so they look at our platform and outside of using it for, uh, you know, some explainability about their models or using it for some rapid prototyping because it's pretty easy to spin up a model and see if there's a there there. Um, yeah. They're like, this tool does not provide me with the you know dials and controls that I need to do my job. I'd much rather be working in a Jupyter notebook or some other like more right. technical platform. Um, but you know, so so we've intentionally um, shaped the product specifically to our user who's not that technical. Um, and so, and yeah. so like our our goal is to enable you know, the 90% problems, which is like, you know, the, the long tail of people working in your business operations uh, with, uh, you know, like in marketing, sales, support, uh, HR, mm-hmm. or finance, um, to start to leverage machine learning in their daily workflows. Uh, right. And, and you know, that that's our goal. Um, and, and, you know, any machine, there's so much low hanging fruit in value extraction from data. And then um, I think people are waking up to the fact that you can use these um, AI supported tools or, or ML auto ML tools um, to start to do uh, tasks on an individual basis that don't require a huge project spun up around them. I um, mean, and that, you know, that's, right. that's been like a lot of what we've seen with the sort of emergence of GPT and some of these other generative tools. Uh, you know, they help anyone working in text or image creation, do their job more effectively. Yeah. We're making a tool that helps anyone work with data, do their job more effectively. Right. Right. So I want to come to the, to the other tools in a second, but I, I want to yeah. focus a little bit on the, on the data viz piece. Where, where there's really two parts of it, which is really, which I found really fascinating, obviously from the from the data viz side, is um, you can a user can go into Accio and and tell it aspects of the data, can describe the data, um, can also describe, as you mentioned, you could describe, you know, this is, I want this and this date format and just do it for me. But also there is, it seems, I mean, I haven't really gone and used the tool too much, but like there is a way to build these narrative charts and graphs to sort of build more of that storytelling piece as you were kind of talking yeah, about a little bit yeah, so, earlier. So really like um, two, really two, two pieces in there. Um, and, and so we have this idea of a report and the report is mm-hmm. like, a, it starts as sort of a blank canvas and you can save any data visualization we make anywhere for you in the entire product to the report in any order mm-hmm. you like. And when it's saved in this report, that's shareable with people inside of or outside of your org, if you so choose. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and it's a data pipeline back to your data warehouse. So as your data environment evolves, that report grows right along with it. Um, and mm-hmm. so like, it's still on the user as the subject matter expert to say, show me, well, I mean, you can ask it, show me three interesting things about my data set and it will. Right. Um, but right, those might right. not be the topical interesting things that you care about. So, right, um, right. so it's up to you as the user to, to have some idea of what your objective is, right? Like, a, you know, mm-hmm. that, that that's what's like, a, you know, first and foremost important is like, what are you trying to accomplish as a business and make sure that the data set that you're working with is relevant to that. You know, you can't mm-hmm. have some wildly out of bounds data set, but 
once you've got that bit covered, it's pretty straightforward. You can say, show me this relationship and that relationship, show me this over time, um, you know, filter this down to show me things that look like this, and it'll do that all automatically for you. And then you can save all of those things in a report and reorder them. And and then those will be live pipelines right there, like really easily. And then the uh, the lift to yeah. like sort of visualize your data is is the lowest it's ever been. Um, you know, it's, it's, as opposed to trying to make these charts in any other tool, I think, it, you know, like, and, and by the way, like everyone is going this direction. This is not just going to be us using like large language models to parse your ask right. into, into charts. Yeah. Everyone's going to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, everyone's doing it yeah. but it's, uh, but it's making people wildly more efficient, uh, in terms of their mm-hmm. execution. And then, but, but, you know, it's not just like, show me a graph of what's going on in the data today, but you can also then take any of the driving factor analysis that comes with training a machine learning model put that in the report too. And then if you're using that model in a deployed fashion, the monitoring of that model's prediction. So like your trends over time are all like uh, pushed through to the report as well. Um, and then mm-hmm. the vision for where we're going to take that is um, as we watch your data change over time, we can start to build time series models for every chart. Um, c- there, Cause there's basically three questions every business have, which, which is like, what's going to happen? Yep. Why is it going to happen? And what can I do about it? Right. Yep. Um, yep. And those all like require a bit of a time like view of things like, uh, you know, you can't just show someone the latest static view. Um, if you really want to yeah. know how you're trending, you want to know like how you're trending and how the driving yep. factors are trending. Um, yeah. And then, you know, ideally, if you're working with the time variable, you want to know the lag between your driving factor and your outcome. Um, mm-hmm. So so if we tie this back to like a marketing funnel, you know, it's like how, how, how long between when a lead enters the funnel to when deals convert. And then if my, uh, and what's the relationship between the volumes there? Uh, And then, you know, so I could look back and say, okay, what's happened in the last six months to my top of funnel? And what do I expect that's going to do to my revenue in the next six months? Uh, And and we could show that to you. And so is a user able to pull in external data? So I could imagine, you know, can you pull in like daily stock market prices or daily or, you know, whatever, you know. You know, unemployment rates from the Fed, GDP numbers, like, could you pull that in without having to pull that into your data and then load it into Accio? Is Accio able to pull directly from these other sources? We now? can we can pull from multiple sources and merge your data together. You have to have some mm-hmm. join information that could be like a date or an ID or sure. something. Um, yeah. So so we do make that possible. Um, it's, uh, at, you, you do have to have a live pipeline to wherever the data source is. Uh, and so right. um, you can you can do that via API or, you know, so it kind of like the answer is it depends on the integration. Um, but, but we are integrated with platforms like Snowflake uh, and Snowflake has like a pretty robust data marketplace as well, where you can get data feeds um, for various stuff. And then of course you can join those and, and do the analysis on them. So, uh, but, but it's the right question because interestingly, the way to make machine learning models or predictive outcomes more accurate is to bring data you don't have to the table. Right. You can only make them slightly better by making your machine learning process better. But if you bring data right. that's relevant to the outcome that you don't have, you can make them massively better. Uh, and so the long-term uh, game here, I think, is all in data augmentation. Uh, and, and in fact, that, that's what really separates like using a, a, an ML tool like this in your business uh, from using like a GPT-4 to like write generative content in your business. Cause with, mm-hmm. with a tool like that, it's a level playing field. Everyone has access. It's, you know, it's like the mm-hmm. internet, basically it, the ability yeah. to ask a question in Google, like made everyone more efficient. Um, right. It's even better with GPT-4, I would argue. Uh, but, um, but everyone has the same benefit once they figure it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's just an adoption race. And, you know, I think we can all see adoption is going to be incredibly fast. Um, yeah. Your, your business is unique data. That's your like gold. That's your competitive moat. That's the thing you can build insights off of that no one else can. Uh, and so mm-hmm. um, this this tools the value of the tool is a little bit different because it it really lets you start to leverage your business data and any data you can pull in that's relevant to your business outcomes. So the more you can gather, typically the better is. And and so um, in the longer term roadmap, uh, you know we're we're definitely interested in how we can help you augment your data with things that are relevant to your predictive outcome. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think that probably starts with some user guidance because, you know, things that impact your outcome, um, searching the world, you know, called the world of data is like a lot of data out there and it's growing, yeah. <laughs> growing exponentially <laughs> every day. Um, searching that for relevant data is, is kind of a hard task today. Although, yeah. you know, with, again, with large language models that can parse context, that starts to get a little bit easier too, because you can start to like narrow down the search. Yeah. And I, and I, 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 I recognize the goal of letting 
anybody go in and use it. Um, is do do say I'm the head of HR at my company. Mm-hmm. I don't know anything about machine learning. Don't know anything about code. But can I bring my data science team into the tool so that they can sort of push the boundary? Say they could try to think of something simple, even something simple. They could pull data from an API. You know, maybe implementing code within the tool to get to extract those data from an API. So t- yeah, typically how this would work is the data engineering team would already be putting together like topical views of the data for the relevant groups. Um, so, so as the HR leader in a business, um, you would have access to some pre-groomed data feed um, that's been pulled from various sources and joined together inside of your data warehouse. And mm-hmm. you, know, you probably have some analysts today doing reporting off of it, uh, telling you how right. you're doing at your job um, and, and how you're executing against your key initiatives. Um, you can plug that data set straight into Accio. You don't need to pull anyone in to do any tasks, although... If you want to bring more or different data to the table, you, you may need to involve, depending on the technical nature of gathering that data, yeah. somebody from the data engineering team or an advanced analyst mm-hmm. who's able to go pull it together. You can also join that together in platform if you need to. It's pretty simple. You just say, this column and this column and these two data sets have the matching IDs, go join the rows. Um, yeah. We even do fuzzy match. So like if, if you have like a closest uh, like text fields, for example, and you could do that across multiple columns. So we try and make it easy to bring more data to the equation because strategically like that's important for us in the long haul. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, the, the way you, your, your data science team, if you ask them to do a task is going to do it in a, in a notebook because they're going to have mm-hmm. more control over it and, and they're right. going to bring you back something um, that's a little bit more complex to look at, but maybe a little bit more powerful. Um, mm-hmm. The place where you start to use us is, you know, the the reality is the HR person doesn't get a lot of attention from the data science team. You know, they're yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're working on yeah. something that's super high priority, um, and so they don't really have a solution today. And that's what we're building for them um, mm-hmm. is something that makes it so that they can get in there. But yeah, there's there's situations where we have the data engineering team building the feeds in order to enable Mm -hmm. the business users to start to like interact with and look at the answers. But we're typically today used by an analyst who's already fairly comfortable working with the data um, with a, with like a few of the business owners getting into it and, and, you know, starting to understand what they can do with it, with the platform. Right. Where do you see the data? uh, uh, The, I mean, there's a lot, I know there's a lot going on. You've got a lot of stuff in the, in the hopper, but where do you see the data viz part? going of the tool i you know i think like that's the most important piece uh like everything happening under the hood is kind of abstract like it it doesn't really help you understand what's going on um and so you know when 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 we talk about ease of use you know we're we're talking really about two things one one is like navigation right like uh like like making sure that your workflow makes sense um, but mm-hmm. but probably the more important thing is is visualization of like the data patterns, um, and and that's like communicating a complicated thing that's going on in your data in a way that anybody can look at it and under understand it. And uh, you know that that's been a problem. Like I mean I mean that's that's a problem forever, right? Like yeah. that that's right, very right, complex. Right. Uh, yeah. And and the litmus test on that, like, like I said, is like you know you show someone a chart and. If they can understand it without asking a question, <laughs> you sort of passed it. Um, yeah, yeah. You'd be surprised at how often you can't understand a chart without asking a question if you really think about it. Like, um, it's, mm-hmm. it's pretty hard. Um, and so, so I think like continuing to iterate there is is incredibly important. Uh, I suspect, um, you know, we're we're putting some pieces in place where people can give feedback on some of the generated vis- visualizations when you when you request a chart. We actually use a language model to write the code to make that chart, and then we make the chart. Mm-hmm. Um, and we stick to some common chart types like scatter plots and bar charts and pie charts and stuff like yeah. that. Um, you know, line charts. Uh, but um, but as we get more complex there and start to be able to show more visualizations, we're going to add like a thumbs up, thumbs down. Like, uh, did this make sense to me? And, and try and keep iterating on uh, displaying the information in a way that's that's uh, parsable let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But but for sure, that's we live and die by that. Because the right. minute somebody can't understand what's going on in the platform, um, you know, we're, we're kind of like toast. Uh, you know, they're, well, also, they're it, just disengage, yeah. disengaged. Well, it also sounds like if I am the head of HR, I'm probably communicating to 
other folks who are not in that data science team, right? Like, like, you know, I'm trying to pull this stuff together. I'm trying to make a case for either the folks that work for me or the folks I work for and trying to make these cases and, and they may not be the, the data science folks. So I really right. do need to work on the. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that, yeah. that's always been like a, it's like a PowerPoint problem, right? Every board meeting I've ever yep. sat in is a series of like different charts you're looking at. Um, right. And you're trying yeah. to figure out what's going, <laughs> what's going to happen, what's going why on? it's yep. going to happen and what you can do about it. Right. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then like, um, you know, to, to the extent that like, that you've ever like been really impressed with someone's work in one of these meetings, it's always because the visualization and explanation is clear and makes sense and is concise. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and to the extent that you've ever been frustrated or confused in one of these like and, and sessions, like regardless of where you sit in an organization, it's always because here's a random chart I made. That's like uh, not clearly explained with like yeah. um, with some assumptions behind it that are also not clearly explained. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah. and then it's trying to sell you a conclusion, uh, which I don't know if I should believe, right? Like, uh, yeah. you know, like, uh, that's why I say there's like, there's like lies, damn lies and statistics, right? Like, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. cause, cause you can really shape a story with data. Um, and, and sometimes like, you know, that, that shaping of the story, the, the shaping that went into the story is is not clear, um, and and right. so so yeah, visualization and also like um, surfacing of assumptions or, or driving factors, as we try to call them, like is, is I think very important. Um, you know the right. the nice thing about being able to use machines to do that is you know you, you don't get like um, you don't get these mistakes so to speak. It just says here's the pattern in that data. Um, mm -hmm. You know you could still filter it. You could still remove relevant information. Uh, all of that could still happen, but. But for the most part, it's less prone to interpretation, uh, like, like yeah. mistaken interpretation. So right. I think it, it right. helps with shared understanding. And, and, then, and then, of course, like you have to show it in a manner that's understandable and simple. Yeah, so. understandable. Right. Yeah. Um, what, um, what's been going on over the last couple of months for you all? I mean, with Dolly kind of first a few months ago and chat GPT, like what, what have you been seeing? Yeah. Uh, you know, like. Uh, it's it, I call these like the Gen two wave of AI tools, and and there's a yeah. there's a few like um, there's a few key things that are happening with them that make them so. Um, you know, I think uh, I think the most important first principle of all of these is their self serve. Um, and if if you think about it, most of the tooling that existed before these tools was not self serve, so no individual yeah. user could really go get big value from it in their daily job. Um, right, right, and uh, and so that's uh that change and then like general awareness uh amongst everybody that suddenly you can get more efficient with a self serve tool um is what's uh is, has caused like a massive influx of awareness like i i think it's happening across the board um mm -hmm. and and there's a lot of like noise uh associated with that but also uh a lot of like uh a lot of interest you know we we're getting like a uh, massively more inbound order of magnitude more inbound like uh mm. over the last three months than we did over the year before um yeah. and uh and it's all just people realizing i could start to use this myself to do these jobs uh it'll make me more efficient um i you know i call it like sort of a ground up like uh like uh ai like thing where where like mm -hmm. um you get quick wins you see the value immediately. These don't have to be big projects anymore. They don't have to take, yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and tens of people to, to do in, in a business. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, that's making a big break breakthrough, I think for everybody. And, um, you know, the, the second important thing is uh, I, I think the most successful businesses in adoption will be using these everywhere in their org. So, so we've, you know, like just internally um, we're telling everyone that they have to be using these tools in their job or, you know, they, they're not a fit for our organization. You can't be an AI native company and not have everyone yeah. Well, yeah. work AI natively, but, but especially as yeah. a startup where you're resource constrained, um, you know, the ability to make people like two times as efficient at their job, that's massive. Right. And, and, right. you know, that like even, even co-pilot, like we didn't talk about like uh, software engineering, um, yeah. but a lot of what we do is software engineering. And uh, the ability to have a, a companion like code generation tool that makes you more efficient at writing software, um, that's mm -hmm. been a massive game, game changer for us in terms of execution speed. Um, so, yeah. so really, like, I think the point is everyone's waking up to, it doesn't matter what your role is. If you're not using one of these like tools to make yourself more efficient at it, um, you know, you're probably working slower and less effectively than everyone else uh, or will be sometime soon. Right. I think we're still a little early in the adoption curve, but yeah. But it's happening, and not, fast. and not trying to get yeah, right. Not trying to get Bing to say they're in love with you, but actually trying to like yeah, like um, it, I should like, say, yeah. like, but actually doing work. 
I mean, yeah, you can you can manipulate many of these generative tools to to say what you'd like, sure. and then you know get some like awareness buzz in Twitter or something about it. It's fine, right. uh, but right. but they actually are very efficient, like uh, practical tools in businesses. If you if you and and the trick there I've I've seen, especially like with most of the generative tools, is figuring out how to prompt it effectively. Um, I think there's mm-hmm. an entire skill set around that. And actually, when we build them into our user experience, which we do more and more places in our product, um, the trick there is how we prompt the uh, NLP engine in the back end, um, given the user input. So, you know, if you ask to transform a date, um, we don't just send over like uh, transform a date to GBT. We we send a big structured prompt um, that will get yeah. us back exactly what we need to transform that date in our platform. And, and it's taken us a while to iterate on that. Um, mm. And we do some other things too, like we take your, the code that we get back to apply to the data table, and then we send that back to the language model and ask it to describe what it does verbosely. Yeah. And then we show you like, here's how it was interpreted. Um, because a lot of times like natural language is not the most like um, complete way of specifying an ask. You know, people are, right. people can be very loose in their natural language. Like I see this all the time. Yeah. And so when we give you back, oh, here's how it interpreted your ask, you'd be like, oh yeah, I see why I took it that way. I got to like right, restate that. Right, yeah, um, that's interesting. Sort of helps yeah. close the loop. And then, and then like people learn like really fast, like, like Google, like like the the closest analog I can come up with is like Googling something. Like there's an art mm-hmm. to searching things online. Like yes. you know, some people are better at it than others, uh, and you kind of mm-hmm. learn it by like searching and you know, like uh, iterating through it until you figure out how to fr- frame your query to get the response mm-hmm. you're looking for. Um, same thing right. to working with any of these tools. Um, there, there's a there's a learning curve, but once you're past it, um, you can get a lot of real value out of it. And I see some people like trying it and saying it didn't work. I'm like, well, you mm. probably didn't ask it the didn't question work. in the yeah. right way. Yeah, it's, right. It's really, right. really the thing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and I can kind of maybe, yeah. you know, and and so like, yeah, yeah. Um, lots of it's noise. It's the computer's there. fault. Yeah, yeah. It's the like, computer's fault. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. To some extent, like these tools are going to get better faster, and and uh, I think, sure, you know, like before you before you know it, like it'll just work, and people will be like, I don't know why I didn't see this in the beginning, like, uh, right, yeah. You know, um, before we go, how can people sign up, use it? What's the, what are all the details? I mean, I'll, uh, you know, everybody can check out the links. I'm, they're on the show notes, but what are the details of getting in and starting to use it? Yeah. I mean, we, we have an open platform. That's kind of been our philosophy from day one. So anybody can make an account and try and get a free trial for a couple of weeks. Um, mm-hmm. Just click uh, create account. We've got some onboarding in there that'll walk you through it. We've got some demo videos, um, but but you can just upload your data or connect it if it's in a live data source and uh, and you can get right into uh, to like, manipulating it with natural language, you know, creating visualizations and, and building ML models. Um, and then, you know, we, we do have a, a second motion where we help you. So if you're a business mm. and, and you need some assistance or want to understand how to best leverage it in your particular area, um, we have solutions engineers who are set up to help do proof of values for those businesses. So if you'd like that, you can just request a demo and we'll get in touch and, you know, we'll help like uh, prove the value to you. Um, you know, we're set up so that you know, we, we win when you win, like, uh, you know, our pricing is on the lower end of prices. Uh, you know, if you're not getting value from machine learning, you're probably not using it in the right way. Um, you know, th- <laughs> this should ROI very, very quickly for your yeah. business. Um, and, uh, yeah. and we'll help you get there. Cool. Well, I'm excited to see what happens. It's uh it's an interesting time to say the least. So, um, good luck with everything. I'm excited to see how it plays out. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, it's, it's exciting awesome. and, uh, looking forward to seeing where things go. Yeah. Thanks, John, for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to this week's episode of the show. I hope you enjoyed that. Hope you'll check out Accio and their services and maybe play around a little bit. If you would like to support the show, please rate or review the show on any of your favorite podcast providers. This show is now available on Zencast or Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn, anywhere you get your podcast providers. Of course, also directly on policyviz.com. So until next time, this has been the Policy Viz Podcast. Thanks so much for listening.